Good evening. Good afternoon, buddy. Hello. How are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good, Scott. How are good, you? Good, good. Matt, how are you doing? I'm good, buddy. You doing okay? Doing pretty good. Katie, how are you doing, baby? <laughs> <laughs> She's eating her cake. She's doing good. Christy, how are you doing? I have to be up at 4.30 in the morning. Rock on. That's pretty early, you know so hopefully I we don't. won't go too long. You don't. You don't. Rabbits are already in the car. Are they? Cool. They are. So now that you have heard from us, listeners... We are going to dive into this topic that we picked up a couple weeks ago, and it has to do with healing, divine healing, and sign gifts in general, and how that relates to the kingdom that's mentioned so often in scripture, the coming kingdom, in fact. And so we ended last time talking about the new apostolic reformation, the seven hills or the seven mountains of the new apostolic reformation. And by the way, it's not an organization really, or a denomination, it's a movement. And so it's part of a particular mode or expression of the charismatic movement. And it's also known more generally as the word of faith movement. So I'm using all these interchangeably. I know that one could really get into the history and be nitpicky about what's what, but I'm not doing that. Uh, we're just going to look at all this as a unified whole. What are the things that latter rain Word of Faith and New Apostolic Reformation all have in common. And so we talked about how eschatology is key. Eschatology is key to this whole debate about sign gifts and whether or not the gift of apostle and prophet are still in force today. And so we discussed the three main different views of the millennium because eschatology all revolves around the millennium, it's nature. There's only one reference to the thousand years in the Bible, and it's in Revelation chapter 20, and that's it. Now, it's referred to many places in the Bible, and we could look at that, and I think that we probably should. I don't believe that we actually read 1 Corinthians 15 last time, so we will look at that. That's where Paul touches on the millennium without actually calling it the millennium without mentioning 1,000 years. The Old Testament gives a ton of examples of the Jews having their kingdom restored, being regathered back to the land, having David on the throne, a reference to David's descended after the flesh, Jesus the Messiah reigning, and the Jews having dominance over the other nations during that time period. Again, it doesn't mention that it's a thousand years, but according to John in Revelation 20, it's 1,000, and John wouldn't be the first person to introduce this idea in rabbinic sources um, they believed in a millennium. And so I think that we can say that John is saying that is a correct idea. Obviously, not everything that was believed about the millennium by the Jews is necessarily accurate. We have to go to scripture for that. But it was a Jewish idea that existed prior to John writing Revelation chapter 20. But anyways, we'll talk more about that on Sundays because we're going over the end times and talking about the early church and whatnot. And so... Let's start by reading in 1 Corinthians 15 as we talk about the kingdom in the two different states of the kingdom. So biblically, the kingdom is either understood as the millennium or as the eternal state following the millennium. And so whenever you're interpreting scripture and it mentions the kingdom, what exactly is being referred to? That's important. So 1 Corinthians 15, verse 22 I'll read for us there. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming. Then come at the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Now, I remember preaching a sermon on this a while back when it talks about Jesus putting down all rule and all authority and power and then giving the kingdom to God, his Father. This is presenting Jesus as a conquering warrior who, on behalf of his Father, enters the world, subdues the world. That's the age of the millennium, 1,000 years. And then at the end of the millennium, there's a final rebellion known as Gog Magog. Jesus, of course, puts that down 
And after that, we have the great white throne judgment, the final judgment. After this, the new heaven and the new earth are made, and that kingdom is presented to God the Father. And then we see at the very end of Revelation, the new Jerusalem descends. So it's like Jesus has made way for the Father to bring his throne and to set it up on the new heaven and the new earth, or the new earth in particular. And it then says that the throne of God and the Lamb will be there in the midst of the new Jerusalem. So Jesus, as the Son of God, has shared a throne with his Father from eternity past. He left the side of his Father to be incarnated to die for our sins. After he rose again, he ascended to heaven, and now he is at the right hand of the Father today. But during the millennium, he will once again leave the right hand of the Father and set up a throne that is independent of that on earth. And so he will reign in his Father's place as his representative in Jerusalem, in the Holy of Holies itself, as the Shekinah glory of the Lord, which has come back to the temple. And it will be after the millennium that everything is as it should be once again. You're going to have the Father and the Son side by side on that throne in the New Jerusalem. And so the first phase of the kingdom is what's referred to here by Paul when he says, He shall have put down all rule and authority and power, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies un under his feet. So when it says he must reign, this is referring to that independent reign of Christ. Of course, he does nothing independent of his father, but he is carrying out his father's commission as he was sent into the world to redeem the world the first time, the second coming, he sent into the world to subdue it. And so that's during the millennium. But after he puts it down at the end of that time period, he gives it to Father, and the Father comes down from heaven, the new Jerusalem set up on earth, and they have a joint throne for all eternity. So that would be the final phase of the kingdom after all rule, authority, and power has been put down. So when I talk about the kingdom, sometimes I'm referring to the millennium, and sometimes I'm referring to the eternal state. And I try to make that clear when I talk, but if I don't, then just pay attention to the context. But the New Apostolic Reformation has this idea of the kingdom that involves taking certain aspects of society, such as business, government, family, religion, media, education, and entertainment. We're going to take those back. Those are the seven mountains. We're going to conquer those mountains, and God will, in effect, reign over the world. And so the kingdom is, is, is envisioned in a figurative way rather than a literal way. So Christ is reigning over the world through the church. So this is a post-millennial idea that the kingdom is something that will come as a result of the labors of the church. Now, the amillennial view is very similar. It downplays the literal nature of the millennium. But the difference is, amillennialists believe that the kingdom is now. So they believe that Satan is already bound in the sense that he has been defeated by the cross and the resurrection. So literally, they don't believe he's bound. They believe mm. that he's you know roaring about as a lion, just like premillennialists do. But they have to take that reference to Satan being bound and if they're not going to take it literally to refer to an actual millennium, they have to make it refer to the church age, which is what they do. Postmillennialists, on the other hand, they have a, a very interesting theology. It's almost like a already not yet theology. Mm. They'll say that in a sense, the kingdom is already in us. We have kingdom power and authority, but we have to actualize it through faith. And that's the word of faith move. It. So if we want to bring in the kingdom manifest. and see it manifested, there you go. If we want to manifest the kingdom and, and make it actual, and we have to take the potential that we have, the Holy Spirit, and with the right amount of faith, we can see things done. We can see healing done, of course, other signs performed. But as a result of all this, we'll take back these seven mountains of society. So we talked about this last time, and, and I think we are all in agreement here. Right. And hopefully the people who are listening to us will agree that we are not capable of doing this without the direct intervention of Jesus. Absolutely. And he's promised to physically return, visibly return right. in the clouds to accomplish this. And so while we are supposed to be fighting battles and yep. waging spiritual warfare, we do not believe that we will be able to claim society and make it a society that is pure and holy and good in the eyes of God. We believe that we are going towards a Babel worldwide mm -hmm. on a community-wide level. Yes, we can see revival happen. We can see families change. We can see individuals come to the Lord. But as far as the world is concerned, it will be progressively worse yep. as we approach the coming of the Lord. So that's a huge divide between the premillennial view and what the advocates of the New Apostolic Reformation believe. Now, as far as the popularity of this, postmillennialism was actually really popular, independent of Pentecostalism. So mm. it's yeah. very popular today among Pentecostals who advocate word of faith. But back in the day, 
uh, in the 19th century in a completely independent way. They believed that the post-millennial view was probably the right one because they saw social reform. They saw science and industrialism as signs that the kingdom is coming. It's like, getting better. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah, things are getting better and we can see a golden age take place. So that view that Christianity could dominate the globe mm. and we could see a transformation that wouldn't require the physical return of Jesus. That was a very popular view. But when the war worlds happened, and there were other yeah. things too, but when the world wars happened, uh, there was, of course, a, a shattered dream. Yeah, absolutely. You know, they saw the world dividing you know, people taking sides during the war, you know, after the war, people are picking up pieces. We still really haven't yeah. picked up the pieces since World War II. In right. a way. Um, and so because of that and because of a number of other things like moral degeneration, mm. there are a lot of people who live in the U.S. now who can look back to like the World War era or pre-World War era. And they could say, man, things were better in so many ways than they are now. I mean, obviously there was sin back then, there's sin now. But in certain ways, we were closer to our biblical roots as a, as a nation than we are today. And so you could talk to my Nana about that. She can tell you how when she was young, you know, everybody was in church. You know, it, was, right. it was a community thing. Everybody was in church. And uh, people learned about God and Jesus in public schools. Yeah. And evolution just wasn't taught at all. She can't recollect that being taught when she was young. Mm -hmm. And a lot of changes took place uh, in the middle of the 20th century after World War II that just caused things to go down. And that's what we're seeing today. I think we're, you know, we're on that slippery slope, well, I, mean, I believe. The, but the women were brought out of the homes and put in the, in the factories and the whole family situation just degraded from there also. Yes, True. yes, absolutely. And, and we, do, we don't see a nuclear family anymore. Uh, we're not seeing it as something virtuous, uh, something honorable to praise. You know, it's seen as patriarchal. It, it's seen as a negative thing. And those who claim to be progressive, they want to see it done away with. And so we, we're seeing the, the dissolution of a lot of things that the foundations we foundations are being eroded. What's that? The foundations are being eroded. absolutely yes. And so this is something that Christian society can really see happening. In particular, um, it happened in Europe first before it happened mm -hmm. in the U.S. I mean, Europe was you know dominated by Christianity uh, during the World War era. Uh, still, Christianity was dominant. After that, we start to see things change, and so. We also see a, a Not new in Germany. Well, <laughs> sorry. Well, the, the Christian community was influential enough that Hitler they, wanted they to get it on his I side. Mean, yeah, the Bonhoeffer and, and all that. Yes, stuff. yes. Yeah, no, Obviously, big issues there. Yeah, <laughs> uh, we won't go into that. But uh, the new world order emerging today is, I think, another sign that makes premillennialism so appealing because we see, if you take scripture literally, I mean, we do see the revival of an empire yeah. emerging. I mean, we see Europe, which was shattered by the world wars. It's becoming more unified. It's coming more cohesive, especially with all that's happening right now with Russia. I mean, Western Europe, I mean, they're really linking arms over this. And on top of that, we have more like an economic forum that are trying yes. to do worse bugs. things than the they Nazis ever bugs. thought of. Yes, in the name of unity, in right. the name of this totalitarian yes. uh, regime, we're going to bring everybody together. That, that globalistic thinking, uh, post-World War II, really, really popular. It's becoming more popular. Yep. Uh, and now it's, it's no longer... You know, most people back in the day, it was your nation. You know, you were patriotic. That's you right. loved your country. Now they're discouraging that. They don't want you to love your country. Uh, they want you to essentially hate your country. Uh, that's yeah. what people are being taught today in America. Hate your country. And rather, we need to be progressive again. And, and they define that as getting on board with other countries. And, and let's no take, a, take, I was about to say those exact yeah. words, take away the borders, common currency. All of this from a premillennial perspective is like, okay, you don't have to. Look it's too like far to see it. in the boxes in Matthew 24 and in exactly. Revelation and Daniel. Exactly. Yep. Absolutely. And, and that's why I think that dispensationalism, I think that, you know, people like um, David Jeremiah and Hal Lindsey and Tim LaHaye, you know, add many others to the list. I think that they were so popular and people like them are still so popular today because we can see these things happening. You yep. know, and, and this is what was predicted. I mean, long before Israel we, we, was a nation. Yes. In the late 1800s, there was a revival of premillennialism. And there were people who were saying Israel will be restored. I mean, they're making these predictions mm -hmm. based on literal reading of prophecy. And it's happening like it's happened already. And we're still seeing 
uh, these things emerge. So a pagan revival is another thing. So we, our congregation, and many others that I've talked to about this, and, and I've brought this up as a conver- conversation started with many other believers, and it has to do with paganism among young people, the younger generation going mm-hmm. back to it. And when I was in high school, evolution was so scientific, you know, that yeah. that's how they wanted to present it. It's a scientific thing. It's materialistic. No God. Spiritual is not going to be fit in that at all. But now we're seeing yeah. people hold on to the evolution, but they're garnishing it with a lot of supernaturalism, you know, and the universe. Yeah. They, they talk right. about the universe as a force and, and there's this mystical yeah. you know, aspect to things that's Nature, more appealing. Yeah. Yes. It's so much more appealing than, you know, those God. straight laced materialists. It's Ew. like, there's no God. There's no supernatural, you know, <laughs> we're all going to die. Like people want something more to fulfill yeah. them. So they take the evolution. They still don't want to believe in the God of the Bible. Right. right? So they'll hold on to that evolutionary idea. They don't want a personal creator, right. but they need something. So paganism is right there for them. Yep. And so that's another thing that the Bible talks about. It mentions Babylon the Great. And Babylon was the mother of all the idolatry, yeah. spiritual idolatry. And so when we see people going back to paganism, it's amazing that we're making full circle. We're going right mm, back to Babel in terms of society and commerce, uh, politics. We're moving back to a one world order. But in terms of religion, we're also moving back to Babel. So, so we're oh, yeah. seeing this stuff coming together on multiple levels. And I think that's why a lot of people, myself included, will say premillennialism is so convincing, not just from a literal biblical standpoint, like it's what the Bible says, right? Mm. But we see a lot of confirmation around us. However, here's the thing. If you're not willing to be pessimistic, because it is true that the premillennial view is pessimistic in the sense that we will have to see things get worse before they get better. And people don't like that. So if they're not willing to buy into that, they'll adopt something post-millennial. And I think there's this this thing where in America, a lot of people grew up in a time where they weren't being confronted with these issues. Like, Mm. I would never have thought that I was going to have to deal with like transgenderism and and interact with that. Like people literally denying male and female. Uh, So when people see that happen, and they see government, family, religion, media, education, business, entertainment, all of it. And it's just, they're forcing, especially the entertainment, they're forcing this agenda down your throat. And the social media. Yes, the social media. of the children. Yes, and w- yeah. when Christians see that, they have obviously, praise God, this motive to see things change. Like, we want to things, things to go not just back to the way they were before, but better, right? Right. And, and they'll say, we can do this. So this eschatology is waiting there for them to just kind of pick back up. Yeah. You know, this pre World War theology. Let's we pick work it back hard up. Enough. Yes, yeah. if we work hard, you know, social reform can happen. We if can we get s- Trump back in. Right. And, and, and honestly, there are some people right. who they're part of this that would that. think that way. They I would think that. they would think that if we can just get someone who is, you know, anti left, you know, who will just, you know, tear down all these strongholds. And we yeah. as Christians, if we're praying and, and we're, you know, we're exercising faith. Yeah. And we're doing all the right things spiritually, yep. then we can see this change happen. Now, some people will get on board with it, but they won't be Pentecostal about it. They'll be more reformed and they may not believe in sign mm. gifts. They may be cessationists, but they still believe in changing the political landscape. And they'll say, we want to see things change um, in terms of exercising dominion the way we were meant to. So they'll think of the kingdom as the church having dominion. They'll, they'll want to institute this Old Testament law. Uh, Rush Dooney was the mastermind behind this. He's really popular among the reform community. Uh, there are some people who are in the homeschool movement who are really big into... Like uh, Doug, 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 not Phillips, Doug, um, maybe it is Philip Wilson. Doug Wilson, Douglas Wilson. Is very big. Uh, but I mean, dominion theology, like changing the government. And so they don't like this idea of, you know, left behind theology. They would rather see us, you know, take up the gauntlet, take up the challenge and bring in the kingdom. Uh, You have people who've kind of shifted on this, you know, back in the day, I can remember as a kid watching Left Behind and, you know, Kirk Cameron was in it, right? Yeah. And I can remember loving the Left Behind movies and and Kirk Cameron at that time. uh, Was on board. He was on board with it. You know, he believed in what he was acting. He was premillennial. And, and I don't know if he's done a full shift, but you can tell 
if you do a little bit of research on this, he has kind of shifted more to the post millennial side of things. Mm. He's, he's very reformed, you know? And so I think that he's part of that same crowd that would be classified as reconstructionist. I, I don't think at all uh, that he's on board with word of faith, new apostolic right. reformation. That's another form right. yeah. of post-millennialism. They're both very popular. Right. Okay, and they appeal to different personalities, you know, sure. different denominations really, but, yeah. but they're both becoming popular. When you take the reform reconstructionists and you take the charismatic word of faith people and you put them together, post-millennialism is really challenging mm. pre-millennialists today. It really is. And I know Matt, he could say here that, you know, being in seminary now, you're able to kind of, you know, get your feelers out there and see what people believe. And you shared with us not too long ago, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I remember you saying that you were one of the few like pre-trib, pre-millennialists. Yes. And, and most of the people that you were interacting with in your classes were not. So share a little bit of that for us. So in our online, uh, for our grades, you know, as you know, buddy, sometimes I'd have you do like a debate. And since I was an online student, or I am an online student, they have us do it, uh, you know, obviously online. So they had us basically defend our stance on uh, premillennialism, amillennialism, and postmillennialism. And, you know, I was one of the very few. There was maybe two or three. I was one of them of the premillennial view in the class. Most everyone was postmillennial, and also most everyone else came from the reformed uh side of you know the the aisle there yeah how many are in the class uh there was in mine i think that particular one i think there was around 30 to 32 oh wow yeah. so it was definitely the not the popular yeah. view. And, and you know what's funny that i i can't say that i wasn't that much of a minority when i was at true at mcconnell uh but when i was there um premillennialism was pretty much the norm right among the professors and among the students but they were starting to shift away from the what i would call the traditional premillennial view in the states and that's the pre-trib rapture you know like mm. that that was something that was very much mocked and so while they wouldn't i don't think they would be post-millennial i found that i was kind of in the minority when it came to my conviction about the rapture preceding the tribulation and so i think that there's been you know it's not just overnight right it's little shifts over time, but you know, the idea that post millennialism is becoming very popular nowadays. I mean, it's just a fact. Look around you, but I think that optimism versus pessimism is a big factor involved. Mm. People don't like the pessimism of premillennialism, and also there's the literal, literal versus allegorical uh, hermeneutic. The way you interpret the Bible. If you think that Israel has been replaced by the church, if you think that oh, listen, there's no plan for Israel anymore. They rejected God. God's rejected them. And a lot of people don't think that Israel should be treated with any special treatment because they have rejected Jesus. And that's a fact that as a whole, the Jews have done that. And so Christians who can't wrap their minds around yeah. God keeping them as his uh, ethnic people, his covenant people, yet still rejecting him, yeah. they can't rationalize that, even though it's what scripture teaches. And of course, we've talked about this in church before that it's a picture of God's grace, how even when Christians, when we are unfaithful to God, he is still faithful to us. So yes, the Jewish people have been unfaithful to God. They rejected his son, but yet he still keeps them as his covenant people. And we look for the day that they will, of course, come to their senses and there will be a great revival and great repentance. But if you don't fall in line with that view, then of course, all this stuff about Israel being restored, all this stuff about the temple being rebuilt mm -hmm. and them going back to the land and and the priest offering sacrifices in Ezekiel, that's not something they're comfortable with. So what do they do? It's spiritual. Let's allegorize this. Yeah. And when you actually read the commentaries of these people, you can tell it's, it's very like broad stroke. Like they don't interact with the details very much because yeah. you can't like the only way you can handle these details. is If you say, look, this is pretty literal. All right. That that's why there's so many details. This is actually something that will happen. It's like the tabernacle furnishings. Yeah. Why is it so detail because it's a literal thing he wants them to do that's right but when you get to the amillennial or postmillennial view that they, they have to take that and say oh well it just represents these general truths it's like well that's a lot of detail for some spiritual truths mm. if you know what i'm yeah. saying so those two factors how you interpret the bible and whether or not you're willing to be pessimistic about the future and again pessimism i don't think is honestly the best representation of me and what i believe because after all 
I'm very optimistic about Jesus coming back soon. Right. That's yeah. So that's I don't, exactly I don't I get thinking. that personally when yeah. things get bad, I will actually share this with my students. I'll say, guys, things are getting really bad. Isn't it exciting? And they're like, yeah. what? <laughs> yeah. And yeah. they're like, I don't get that. And I'm like, the reason I'm excited is because the worse things get, the closer that means this sinful age yeah. that began since Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. Yeah. It's coming to a close. Yeah. You know, I, I was thinking the other day as I was thinking about, um, I think you maybe it was you were teaching about the fact that not being any government until um, Noah, right? The world, right? Yes. Yeah. There was so no ordained government. No, yeah. There's no government at all. So when we talk about the days of Noah, we're, we're assuming correctly, I believe, that it's before the flood. Yes. Yeah. Right. Uh huh. If there was no government there, it had to have been really, really, really bad. Yeah, absolutely. We still have government. Yeah. And that's what scares me. Yeah, you know absolutely. what I'm saying? It's like, okay, we keep thinking it's going to be, ser- you know, he's coming soon, he's coming soon, he's coming soon. What if we still got another 30 yeah. years of this? And, and, let's, and worse let's, and worse and worse. Let's define government. So right. was there any just God-approved government before the flood? Of course not. Right. But were there powerful people that put others under their mm, feet? Yeah. Yes. And, and we see that at Babel, don't we? We see God's design for government corrupted because we have one guy right. named Nimrod who right. rules over everybody. And honestly, we can see people heading in that direction because they don't like the idea of a government being by the people and right. for the people. They're more favorable to a socialistic or communist version of government doesn't make any sense. where you put someone in authority who controls the mass. And so don't we see that like leading the way to the Antichrist? Well, absolutely. And, and I don't know if that's what they think socialism is. They think socialism means and communism means everybody's equal and we're all going to get along and sing Kumbaya. Um, I think that's what they really think that, you know what, that's what they're sold. That's what they're deceived into right. believing. Yeah. yeah. That's not at all. What it, it sounds is. good on the surface, but sure. it's not. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's not going to be good if, you know, America becomes a socialist country. Like, mm, well, look at Canada right well, see, now. See, capitalism, they hate it because they think that, okay, these people are, you know, taking advantage of other people all in the name sure. of almighty dollar. And yes, it does happen. Absolutely. But here's yes. the thing. The reason they're able to do that is because they have freedom and, and yes. freedom. Yes. Can you use freedom to be a jerk mm. and to hoard money to Absolutely. yourself and take advantage Ebenezer of other people? Scrooge. Yes. But yes. But if you don't have the freedom. Right. Okay. Then you, all you have is the alternative, which is someone telling you what to do. Exactly. Well, what right. happens if you don't like what they tell you yeah, to do? That's well, you've already surrendered your freedom. That's you right. got no say. That's right. So people are setting themselves up for big tragedy there. Yeah. Uh, and thinking, well, if we exchange our freedom, you know, to have everybody equal, mm. it'll all be good. But no, that's not how it works. You no. know, people man- leading the show don't want everybody equal. That's right. Yeah, Everyone's you're right. Equal, but some are more equal than others. That's right. You're right. Absolutely. And uh, it's the same thing. We're talking about how this leads to the Antichrist. Um, you know, I think that they're going to see him as the solution to all their problems. Yep. And they're going to say, let's let's all take the power we have, this authority that's invested in us. Yep. And let's hand it over to this guy, because obviously we're not doing good. So let's give it to him. Maybe he can arbitrate. Maybe he mm. can fix things. He's Put it in the hands of one person. And people think that they'll say the world's so divided. Yeah. We need that. We need that one person who can just unify us. Keep it dividing us. Yeah. And, and so <laughs> it's ironic right. that, that this is happening before our eyes. But I mean, all this, like, like I've said, is just exactly think what scripture is told of. The resistance is. What's that now? Think about who makes up most of the resistance. Of. Who. This. The WEF, oh, the whole Christians. the whole system right now that's being forced on people. Who's yeah. fighting against it? Yeah. What happens when they're gone? That's yeah. right. That's right. And it's true. Like the people who are standing against globalism, because they see it as a threat to autonomy and freedom. Those people are generally conservative, and even if they're not Christian themselves, they get their views, whether they realize it or not. Yeah. From Christian principles. I mean, the people who are conservative in our country, but not Christian, the only reason they hold these ideas is because they were passed on to them from Mm -hmm. Christian people who lived in previous generations. And once people realize that, oh, we, we like these values, 
but they're Christian and we don't like Christianity. We're seeing slowly there, there's this disconnect. Like you there's mentioned earlier, the foundation. Yeah. And it's scary because um, I just think that the more and more people throw away Christianity, they're throwing away their rationale for the values that they hold. But and we're, it blends, though. Like I've, I've got coworkers. I've got one in particular. She's very, very conservative, but she's also pagan. She believes that mm. Thor and Odin is real. And that's a conversation I never thought I'd have to have in my mm. lifetime, is mm. actually defending, okay, do I have proof that Thor and Odin aren't real? You know, and that's that's something I've not had to, you know. Gosh, and that's crazy that's, to think that, that you crazy. have those conversations now. When, I, when we took apologetics, my class at True and McConnell, it was, all right, we need to be prepared to talk to Muslims, and atheists. atheists. That's right. right there, those two. And, and Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses, the yeah. pagan cults. Um, but th- those right there, those four. But Maybe we never. Buddhist, but probably not. But rarely did we ever talk about that. Rarely did we talk about Hinduism. It was mainly those big four right there. And we never that were instructed Odin, on how to talk coming. about yeah, the pagan gods, how to talk about Wicca, never. And it's because it just didn't seem to be on the radar of people right. at the time. But now it is. Less than 10 years. So look at how much is changing. Yeah. I mean, this is I'm talking about a diehard Trump-supporting, conservative, gun-toting person that, that really thinks that Thor is real. So but, how much of her grandmother is a Christian? What's is, her, that? is her grandma a Christian? I don't know. Somebody in her life is. Yeah, somebody. I, yeah. She told me what I asked her what she thought of Jesus and told me that she celebrates everything. That's her direct quote. She celebrates everything. Mm. All the things. And I was like, that makes me uncomfortable. Well, see, yeah. what, what's going to happen is if you were to think about Thor and Odin, all right, let's think about the way these people live their lives in, mm. in the Dark Ages, okay, of Viking Scandinavia. Right? Did they have sacrificing humans yeah, did, to appease the gods? Well, what was their version of morality? Did it come anything close to Christianity? Right. No. So what right. happens when people again realize that Christianity and conservative morality are linked to one another? Okay, I think that what's going to happen is because they don't have a reason for being this way anymore, they're going to fall prey to deception mm. when a new morality comes Absolutely. onto the scene, they're and we're already, already seeing that. it. Already That's this. what I'm saying. It's in the works. So like Christianity is going to be completely cast off. We're seeing that happen. Like we already mentioned with the nuclear family, uh, sexuality, biblical sexuality, yeah. all of these things that are conservative values for us. Yeah. You know, the, the traditional marriage, it's all based on Christianity. I didn't, I haven't read the specifics about this, but I heard some people talking today on Facebook about Candace Cameron Bure. Yeah, um, absolutely. His name, sister. She's catching a ton of flack. Yeah. Because she stood up for biblical definition of the family when they, they pigeonholed her and asked her the question on purpose and she gave a Christian biblical response. So now they're trying to cancel her. I know. And, and so Cameron's sister, that that's what's happening now. Whenever you just say, this is my, this is what I believe. This is my value. This is what I am going to represent. They can represent theirs, but if we represent ours, but we're bigots. Can't do that. We can't do it. We're not allowed to. Um, yeah. uh, but let's move on now. We got one more thing to cover. We won't be able to get to everything that I wanted to talk about tonight, but I don't want to rush this. And for those who are listening, please continue to listen to this particular series. It will take us a while before we get to the end of it. But whenever I have conversations with people and I try to explain them my view on healing and prophecy and tongues and the end times, I, I try my best to explain it to them in that short amount of time that I have, but it would be better if I could sit them down and explain to them where I come from on a number of things, because there are a lot of issues that are connected to each other and you're not going to be able to just get in like two minutes. All right. Why is it that you don't believe in prophecy, tongues and healing? Well, I can give you my best shot to give me two minutes. Mm. All right. But it's, it's what's that? The The Bible says so, you know, but if you want a more in-depth answer, this is a really big issue, a very divisive issue in times and charismatic gifts, huge issues, denomination making issues, you got to take time to actually look at the foundation and build that before you move on to a more clear answer, which we eventually will get to. Okay. But I want to talk now about the types of cessationism. So if you didn't guess already, I am a cessationist. I don't shy away from the term. A lot of people don't like it because of its connotation, but I want to explain what it is and what it isn't. Okay. First off, what cessationist is not. Cessationist is not saying there are no miracles happening today. That is a caricature of cessationism. Cessationism says God performs the miracles in answer to intercessory prayer. However, 
This is not something that God has vested in an individual like a prophet right. or an apostle who has the will to heal people. Okay? Now, they were given insight. They were given a commission that we are not given today. Right. So Peter could walk up to some person and not say, hey, man, I'll pray for you. I'm going right. to pray for you that you can walk. No, he could walk him. up and he could say, I yeah, have the authority to give you this in gift. In the name of Jesus. Absolutely. Up. And so that's the difference. Cessationists would say, God heals people all the time. Sure. It's wonderful. And it's evidence yes. for the message of the gospel. But we don't have the authority to decree healing. Correct. Or even announce healing. We can only say, we will pray for you. We'll pray with you. And we'll do so in faith, trusting that God will listen to us favorably. And his plan sometimes doesn't line up with our wishes, but he often does people answer. People are healed. He, that's what I'm saying. So yeah. cessationism is not saying people are not healed anymore. Right. It's saying that miracle workers and healers are not given those particular gifts and commissions anymore. Okay. So we need to clarify that first. Now, there are two different types of cessationism. The most common one is the reform view. And I, I call that classic cessationism. And so the definition is there are no more signs because these all validated the ministry of the apostles and prophets, and there are no more apostles and prophets. So we should not expect a renewal of signs before the return of Christ. So you're not going to see the renewal of sign gifts. No more prophets, no more apostles, no more miraculous healing. Okay, as in a gift given to somebody to do that. Uh, I disagree with classic cessationism in this respect. I don't believe that we will not see a revival of these things. I believe we will. Okay, I'm going to read a, a scripture that indicates it. However, I believe that this is a post-rapture outpouring of the Holy Spirit upon the nation mm. of Israel. So will there be tongues and prophecy and miracle working once again? Yes, yeah. absolutely. And that's what would make me different than a reformer or a person who's perhaps Presbyterian holds the more classic view. Now I would agree with them that there are no apostles and prophets today. Correct. Okay? And that's why we don't have these sign gifts. So I agree with you there. I do believe these miracles were used to validate their ministry. Okay. The Bible has been completed. All right. We're, we're in this, you would say a parenthetical age. We don't have the apostles and the prophets. We're building on the foundation. However, will this gift of prophecy once again be poured out upon people in the future? Yes, again, but I believe it's a post-rapture outpouring. So that's what I call eschatological or dispensational cessationism. Very big word there, okay? But I would say there are two reasons why we don't have signs today. Not just one. First one, there are no apostles and prophets. That's the first one. The second one, the kingdom is no longer being offered to Israel. And sign gifts will be renewed when this offer is renewed after the rapture. So mm. when will the gift be renewed of prophecy? It's whenever they have something to prophesy. All right. And what are they prophesying? The announcement, the offer of the coming kingdom. This happened in the first century. They went to the mm. Jew first and then the Gentile. Yeah. They went around preaching even before Jesus went to the cross. Right. And Mar uh, Matthew, not Mark, Matthew chapter 10, he sends them out. He says, don't go to the Gentiles. Go to the Jews. Don't go into any of the cities of the Gentiles. Right. Preach to the Jews and announce them that the kingdom is at hand. And perform all these miracles to show the people that that kingdom is imminent. It's right here. It's on the cups. Okay? All you have to do is reach out and accept it. Repent. It's here. Here. And so I believe that that will be offered again after the rapture. I think that the 144,000 witnesses are going to go around preaching. And I think they're going to say the kingdom is here. And guess what's going to happen? The Jews this time will say, Amen. Yes. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It won't be hypocrisy. It won't be a show. They will genuinely repent. So just as there were 12 apostles who served as these witnesses, mm. okay? You know, and Apostle Paul will say 13. There will be two witnesses in particular in Revelation 11. Mm -hmm. These are going to preach as soon as the rapture happens, basically, or mm -hmm. rather be more technical, as and soon as even. the tribulation begins, the mm -hmm. beginning of uh, Daniel's 70th week. So they're going to begin preaching day one of the tribulation, day one of their ministry. And people will listen. I think that the 144,000 will be probably some of the first converts, some of the first to repent. Those will be sealed and they will also go out. 
Uh, you had the 12, but you also had the 70, right? Yeah. And so I think that these are going to be a special group, just like the 70, who are uh, granted authority to preach and heal and prophesy and so many other things. And if Jog Magog has just gone down, their hearts are going to be ready for that. Yeah. Absolutely. And, I, and that's another thing that plays into this. And we'll be talking about that on Sunday, especially because uh, that's a big part of end times that you just can't ignore. And I, and I think it is around the corner. Every single day that I check the news, I don't check the I'm news looking, every day, but every day I check it, I'm I look up at, Russia and Israel. What, every yeah, day. What's Russia doing? Yep. And, and, I'm, and I'm ready. Post. Yeah. I'm yep. ready. One day I'm going to look it up. One day, Scott, you're going to look it up. It's going to be one of us. Yep. Okay. That same day we're going to notice it and we're going to be telegramming hey, each here other. Is. Here it comes. You know, yep. And we're going to be, there it is, guys. It's coming. It's happening. And I'm going to tell everybody that I know, guys, yeah. watch the news. It's yep. happening right now. And it's going to be awesome because, like you said, Christy, a lot of Jews, they're going to see that happen. Messianic brethren have been preaching this. Too. Gentiles have been preaching this. Yes. And yes, there, there are many uh, non-Christian Jews. rabbis who believe that this is going to happen too. And so when it happens, there's going to be a revival. There will be uh, a bunch of people who abandon secular Judaism yep. mm-hmm. and they take up religious Judaism. Now, will they believe in Jesus? Many probably will at that time, but I think that the, the majority ma- won't. The majority I've won't. Talk to Jews, um, secular Jews. I, I just remember this. At a uh, for work at a conference, anyways, and there were these guys from Israel, and they're sec- secular Jews. And my friend is like, "Oh yeah, these guys are they're from as Christian as well." He's like, "Yeah, they're from there." And it's like, "You know, pleasure to meet you." We get talking. I'm like, "So Gog Magog, you guys aren't expecting it?" And he's like, "I don't know what you're talking about." Mm. So mm. we went through it, told him what it was, what was going to happen, and they're like, "Oh okay, yeah, whatever." Mm. You're right. <laughs> He's not going to be saying whatever after it happens. That's yeah. right. And that's awesome because that's going to get their attention. Yeah. Uh, will they skip fr- straight from that to believe in Jesus? Go, a Christian told me about that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and yeah. that might that might lead a lot of people to automatically just believe in Jesus. I think that's probably yeah. going to happen with some. And there will be a bunch of Gentiles, too. It says this is not just for a testimony to the Jews, but also to the nations. Right. So there will be a lot of people, perhaps people that I know, that just refuse to believe. Yeah. But they've been told by people that this event is going to happen. And when yeah. it happens, they're going to say, maybe I should trust that book after yeah. all. And so that's important. But uh, last thing I want to look at tonight, and then we'll wrap it up. Uh, it's in 1 Corinthians 13. Okay. So if you'll turn hmm. to 1 Corinthians 13. Whether there are prophecies, they will cease. Yes, that's where we're going to go. Because this is one of those passages that I think is abused by people who are advocates of that classic cessationism. I wrote my senior thesis on this and it's funny that I remember presenting it and my class was like, but you didn't tell us what the passage is, is saying. Is it saying that they cease or is it saying that they don't cease? And I said, did you not listen? (laughs) It's I I, I made my whole paper um, for the purpose of showing that this passage in 1 Corinthians 13 cannot be used to either prove or disprove cessationism. And I actually made the argument that it leaves open the possibility that the gifts will be restored one day. And if you look at most books on cessationism, they're going to go to this passage. Like this is like the go-to. Okay. Some of them think that it's a slam dunk right here, Uh, but let's look at it and then you can judge for yourself. But it says, and verse number eight of First Corinthians 13. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there shall be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as I am also known. Now, many people will say for verse number 10, but when that which is perfect is come, okay, that is referring to the completion of scripture. And they'll say the word perfect there can be translated as as complete. And it can. I mean, the word for perfect here to lay on, it can be complete. Um, but when I read this passage and I was reading these cessationist books, I never felt like their argument was really too strong. Mm. I, I, I felt like, okay, it's clearly talking about the return of Jesus. 
I mean, verse number 12, for now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know even as I'm also known. I mean, the Bible, as important as it is, and as inerrant and inspired and infallible as it is, it doesn't tell us everything. Okay, it tells us what we need to know, what we Mm -hmm. need to share with other people. But am I seeing Jesus face to face right now in this life before he returns? Before my body is transformed and I see him literally no, face to face glass darkly right now. Yeah. So, I, I mean, if you were to compare, you know, this with uh, what John says in first John, you know, we shall see him when he sees us and we see him. That's going to have a transformative effect when we receive our glorified body. So I think that's what's being referred to. So what that means is you can't use this argument to prove that prior to the return of Christ, prophecy and tongues completely and utterly cease. Now, what this passage does not do, okay, a lot of people, charismatics would say, oh, well, you just proven our case for us. If these things don't cease until Jesus comes back, then that means they're still around because obviously he hasn't returned yet. But what this passage does do is it allows for the gifts to cease temporarily and Mm. to be revived. Yeah. Okay. So all that Paul is saying here is when Jesus comes back, there will be no need for any of these things, okay? There'll be no need for prophecies, there'll be no need for tongues, and there'll be no need for the limited knowledge that we have in the Bible because we will be able to see face-to-face. Right. We we'll have a and, living word living among us. Absolutely, and so I remember that I read uh, somewhere, I was going through a journal database, and I found a Mennonite article mm-hmm. on this passage. And I was like, oh, okay, well, I'm curious, because it was actually a cessationist article. But this Mennonite article was actually very premillennial. And what the person was arguing was, is this, there will be a restoration of prophecy and tongues Hmm. in the uh, tribulation period. And that probably will continue into the millennium. Hmm. But this, what Paul's talking about, is that time where we receive our glorified bodies. And so we will see Christ face to face and we won't have need of all these other limited types of knowledge. I mean, tongues doesn't tell you everything. It's limited. Prophecy doesn't tell you everything. It's limited. And of course, the completed word still doesn't tell you everything. So I don't think this passage can be used to prove that tongues and prophecy have ceased. And I don't think that you can use it to prove that tongues and prophecy are still around either. I think this passage is often a battleground. And it's sort of a pointless fight. I think you need to look elsewhere to find what you're looking for. Um, If what this was saying is that uh, prophecy and tongues has has ceased because of the writing of Scripture, then that would contradict what we find elsewhere in the book of Revelation. And I'd encourage you, we won't do it tonight, but read Revelation 11, 1 through 6. And when you read that, it sounds a lot like prophecy. Mm. It sounds a lot. It says they will prophesy for Mm. three and a half years, those two witnesses. It says they will perform miracles, fire from their mouth, stopping up the heavens for three and a half years where there's no rain. And they're able to strike the earth with plagues as often as they will. Okay, that to me sounds like miraculous gifts. It sounds like prophecy. So this passage in 1 Corinthians 13 isn't saying that we won't see a revival of those things. So I believe that when we, next time we resume our study, I think that as we look at other passages, the picture will become more clear. But again, the view of cessationism that I'm advocating for in this series is a dispensational one. I think that, yes, right now we're not going to see prophecy in tongues because there are no apostles and there are no prophets now. But I would argue that whenever the rapture takes place and the church is not here anymore, I do think that prophecy will be resumed. And I do think that there will be Jewish Christians who are given gifts. And I think these gifts are going to be the same type of gifts that we see in Acts period. It mentions in Joel chapter two, by the way, that the spirit will be poured out. The young men Mm -hmm, shall dream dreams and the old men will have visions and Mm -hmm. Paul, or sorry, not Paul, get the right apostle here. Peter, he applies that to Pentecost, doesn't he? But yet, if you read Joel chapter 2, that's talking about the end time. So there was a partial fulfillment. There was a taste of it at Pentecost, but it's not done yet. But notice, Pentecost was a Jewish event. 
Okay. He is, Peter is, preaching the kingdom. He's promising the restoration of the kingdom. He's saying, you've rejected your Messiah. Okay, repent and receive the kingdom. Mm. This is not a Gentile message he's preaching. In fact, Paul even calls Peter an apostle to those who were circumcised, as opposed to Paul, who was an apostle to those who were uncircumcised, the Gentiles. So I think that Joel chapter 2, Pentecost, is a Jewish thing that, uh, that uh, applies to the kingdom. And I think that whenever the rapture happens and the church isn't here anymore, and the Gentiles, for the most part at that point, um, are going to be pagan, okay, mm-hmm. they're going to get on board with the Antichrist, it's going to be the Jews who are a light to the world. For the past 2,000 years, if you want to look for truth about God mm-hmm. and Jesus, it's generally a Gentile you're going to go talking to. Right. But starting in the tribulation, everything changes. It's going to be the Jews that are going to be the witnesses to the world. That's and that how was, it was supposed to be. That's how it was supposed to be. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. That they're going to fulfill the calling that God yeah. placed upon their, their nation. And I can't wait to see that. I'll be seeing it from up in heaven. I'll be right, looking yeah. down and watching it. But I'm sure it'll be a wonderful sight. But we're going to stop there. And next week, to give you a taste of things to come, we're going to talk about John the Baptist, uh, Jesus' promise of the kingdom, the disciples' commission to the Jews. Uh, and we're going to talk about how for 40 years after Jesus ascended, the offer to receive the kingdom was extended for 40 years. So we'll talk about that next time. Thank you so much for listening. God bless.